welcome back to another episode of the two third podcast peeps with your peep irene hello how are you if you're watching this on youtube what's up if you're listening to this in the car or in your ears wherever you may be i hope you're having a great day thanks for joining me here today we're gonna do a crossover episode this throwback thursday crossover episode with a person that you've heard in the last couple of episodes so dr neki jamal you heard part one and part two over the last couple of weeks this is actually how we met so we met by um akil his podcast co-host inviting me to their podcast and then we kind of became instant friends and then you know kind of everything just kind of unfolded this is an interesting crossover because so akil reached out to me to be on his old podcast back in 2021 and timing just didn't happen he had sent a couple of dms and then I don't know what happened, just, you know, got lost in the in the shuffle of things. So a whole two years later, that podcast ended in their podcast, the Hi, I'm Doctor podcast kind of started. And uh, he re reached out to me on Instagram again, reminding me that he wants me on the podcast. And, and so he said, yes. Interestingly enough, he kind of knew about my journey as an independent dental hygienist, opening a practice and speaker podcast, you know, Instagram stuff. But his co-host, uh, Dr. Jamal, had no idea. Like, I remember us starting to do the interview and he was just so mind blown that a dental hygienist can own a practice. So you'll kind of see this unfold and at the end I'm going to take the outro and just put it at the beginning like his reaction to the whole episode which was about an hour um I'm going to put the end at the beginning and then you can watch it all unfold kind of backwards because I thought it was really cool so yeah this is a great episode that kind of talks about how I opened the practice what my business plan looked like um how much money I needed for what I have or what I was building at the time, um, how I ended up getting financing, you know, just a little bit of the story from the beginning. And you may have heard this a couple of times or bits and pieces of it in multiple episodes, but this is a really good depiction of where it started and how it's going now. Um, so I hope you enjoy this episode. I, I encourage you to listen to their podcast because they're really cool. They've got great guests on their podcast in a really good format. Um, so if you want more dental stuff, check out the Hi, I'm Doctor podcast. And thanks for having me on your show. I was the first non-doctor on the Hi, I'm Doctor podcast. I got, I have merch to prove it. They gave me this really cool um, yellow sweatshirt. And you all know that yellow is my jam. So that was really fun. And I rocked it on the balcony the other day. And I tagged them on Instagram. Uh, it's really comfy. I might actually do this now and just ship all of the guests that I have on the podcast some tooth or dare merch I just need some, to come up with like something cool because I'm sure they don't want to walk around wearing a sweatshirt with my face on it although that could be fun too <laughs> um yeah so thanks for having me here's the hi I'm doctor podcast and uh I'll catch you guys next week make sure to follow along on YouTube if you're not already watching this on YouTube YouTube shorts there's a blog that goes up on LinkedIn so there's a lot of different places where you can see podcast stuff and uh, let me know if you like this if you want more episodes about me and my practice startup and perhaps this might be an idea or you know you've got questions of how to do it drop the comments in wherever you're listening or watching this and I'll answer them for you and maybe I'll just do a whole episode on answering your questions about starting a practice and what that looks like so let me know hit me up peace out everybody have a great day A kill. We had Irene on the show. Uh, I, I loved her perspective. I can't believe, I didn't even know that was possible. A hygienist running a dental practice and dentists are working, well, contractually contractors or whatever, chair renters <laughs> um, from her. That's that's absolutely amazing. I didn't even know that existed. Have you ever heard of this model before? Never. It's wild. I think it's so cool. It's like, it's, 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 exactly what I would have expected of someone like Irene to do you know yeah. it's like you know you, you see someone like that super entrepreneurial has a podcast has a ton of Instagram following super vocal and I'm like you know before the episode started you know we're researching her I'm like 
does she own this practice? Like she's dentist working under her. That's awesome. It's it's yeah. pretty cool. It's pretty I, cool. I, I think I think that's awesome. And um, I just I didn't know like the steps she went through. I think it's super unfair. You know, as a dentist, we walk into the bank hundred percent. Don't they don't even ask a question? No matter how much debt you have, here's a hundred percent financing on your office, and then she walks in with a better business plan than um, a lot of dentists have. And then, you know, you have to pay 15% up front. And, and that's tough, especially in the dental field when everything costs so much and to build a practice is a million plus. And to walk in needing 15% is, I think would be such a barrier for, you know, any anyone in the field to to get their, you know, feet wet in dentistry. Yeah, yeah, it's it's it sucks. It's super... It's like a double standard for sure. Is it, I don't know if I use double standard, right? Is well, that a double I standard? I, yeah, I guess that would be a double standard. I, I, don't, I know, don't know, but like there's no other hygienists that are asking for that. Yeah, it's it's like, it's ridiculous. It's, it's yeah. sort of ridiculous. And on top of that, it's like, you know, I asked her that question about being an entrepreneur and like I never really thought of it from that perspective, but hygiene, you know, when, when we look at practices, at Sage, like hygiene is such a crucial part to what your practice is worth, because that's like, that's the SaaS part of your business, right? Like that's a subscription part of your business that, you know, people are coming back for, it's like, yeah, you're not always going to get like the same cavity every time from the same patient, but you know, your patients are coming back for hygiene and like looking at it from that angle and thinking how many hygienists are actually entrepreneurial and see the value in what they're bringing to the table. I think more hygienists should be encouraged to go down this path of, you know, it, it, I don't know if it's, if it's practice ownership, but at least being an entrepreneur mm-hmm. because they well, have that, they have that gene, you know? Oh, absolutely. It's it, the, the current model obviously has, has worked for many years, but like all things, there's always time for disruption in every industry. And, and I think we just met the disruptor. So good, good for Irene. I think that's, I think that's amazing. And, and for me, it was an honor to meet her because of just, you know, hearing how she did that. I think that was super cool. And I don't know how many other Irene's are, are going to be able to uh, go down that, that path, but um, that, that's awesome. Irene. And I, I congratulate you for it. Yeah. It's super cool. Well, guys, enjoy guys and girls. Enjoy the, enjoy the episode. Uh, we had a, we had a blast recording. See you soon. Cool. Yeah. Welcome to welcome to this week's installment of uh, Hi, I'm Doctor. Um, and I think Irene, you are the first uh, non dentist we're having Man, on give the pod. It up. Give it up. Yeah. Stop it. it. Just yeah. stop the craziness. <laughs> so, I, so I think you're the best first guest, though. Like the yes. best first yeah. non dental or non non dentist guest. So many people Sorry. are going to come at you in the DMs right now. I know, like, well, what do you mean? I'm fabulous too. You're all nope. wonderful in your own way. <laughs> <laughs> Everyone, everyone's wonderful in their own way. But, not really. but if you, <laughs> but if you don't, if you don't know Irene, for the two of you that don't, um, Irene is huge on Instagram. Uh, I love your page. It's 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 super positive, super fun. Um, but what really makes you unique, and what we want to talk a lot about, is uh, you actually own a practice. Um, and like and like we talked about, uh, you're you're not a dentist, um, but you have dentists working for you there. Uh, so it's, kind it's, of, a, yep. it's, it's a really cool conversation. So why don't you just take a couple seconds, introduce yourself, and then we can kind of get into it. Yeah. Well, you know, in West Philly, Philadelphia, where I was raised, you know, the playground where I spent most Born of my raised. days, yeah, <laughs> you know, chilling out max and relaxing. Um, so yes, I am Canadian based practicing dental hygienist in the city of Toronto. I'm actually a restorative dental hygienist, which means that I can do everything except prep a tooth and restore an implant. Um, that happened after I opened my own practice, which is now almost three years old. It'll be three years in August. Congratulations. Thank you. Thank you. Startup COVID baby. Not that wasn't originally the plan, obviously, but it just happened that way. So yeah, I get to do a lot of really interesting things and the social media aspect of it kind of happened after the fact, uh, been practicing for almost 17 years this year. And I've bopped around. I started in pedo and then I went to perio and then I worked in an ortho practice. I started lecturing for Invisalign. Um, I worked for like a kind of bougie cosmetic practice in Yorkville, um, holistic practice. Like I was just the nomad dental hygienist 
picking up whatever I could, finding her home. I was like, you know, the, the, the like lost puppy trying to find her perfect fit. And that kind of never really happened. Um, so then I just created my own space, um, where I get to do all of those things all in one place. Um, and also be an employer, which is legit the hardest part of all of it. Managing people is not what I expected to be difficult. I was like, oh yeah, great. Like I'm friendly. (laughs) People like me. Like I'm not. They don't care about you. (laughs) No. No. And somehow other people's problems become your problems. Um, and that has been the bane of my existence. That and my double click on that. Double click on that because I think people don't understand the pain it is to be an employer. It is stressful beyond belief. Like the chaos every morning. Do you, either of you own a practice? I do. Yeah. Okay. Next so you know, the, you know, the pain when you wake up first thing in the morning and you roll over and you pick up your phone and there's a text message or like a message in a group chat. Yeah. And there's just like some long winded excuse as to why someone can't come into work and your morning routine of like having a protein shake and riding your Peloton for 20 minutes is now like scrambling to log into the server to figure out what's happening. And it's just like this internal fire that is fueled within you as you furiously scramble your eggs to eat them really fast and get to the office an hour before everyone else to make sure the air conditioner is working. Um, that's the, that's every day for a business owner and I take, I, I took advantage of so many past employers, not knowing what they were going through. Like I'm, yeah. I'm, yeah. Dr. Carol Waldman, if you're listening to this, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's so hard because I'm so lucky. I have a phenomenal uh, practice manager, office manager. Her name is Patricia. Patricia, if you're listening, I'm Shouts. sorry for everything that I do to you to drive you nuts because she's the one that takes those texts. And I get the phone call at 8 a.m. saying, hey, your assistant's not coming in. And I'm just like, oh, shit, here we go. But uh, I totally, I feel your pain. And I feel no matter how hard you try to be so nice and so accommodating, you know, I don't think maybe your employees or your other team members see that. And, and it's, I find it very difficult to be an owner and I don't think I'm a very good one, but it's, it's very difficult. That's not true. I feel your, I feel your pain, man. No, I can smile as much as I want, but they just like, we need an answer. And I just smile bigger because I don't know the answers. (laughs) It's true. I I just posted a, I did a lecture at Voices of Dentistry, which is a podcast conference in Arizona. And luckily I was given like the main stage kind of keynote where my lecture, can we swear in your podcast? What's the rule here? Okay. So the title is Can Shitty Employees Make Great Leaders? And it was a 45 minute kind of TED talk about my experience in three years, taking shitty employees and turning them into awesome leaders. Um, And I posted that today on YouTube with my slides and stuff. And I've received a lot of feedback, like in such short period of time where it's the autonomy that people want, but they don't understand, you know, the decision-making behind the scenes. And I think one of the best qualifications or best attributes of a leader is to acknowledge that you're actually not the best leader because that means that you care enough and you're not arrogant. Did you just call me the best leader? (laughs) Well, I called you not arrogant. (laughs) (laughs) Akil, you heard it here. You heard it here. You heard it here first. Yeah. (laughs) You know, the self-deprecating leaders are always the best ones. eh? Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Irene, give us some of your, uh, your horror stories. (sighs) Oh man. Without sounding like a complete B word. Um, like I don't know why it just seems to be a thing where people just don't show up to interviews. And I know that's like not the worst thing that could happen, but people just like will schedule an interview and not show up for whatever reason, which is really frustrating. Like it shows how little you respect other human beings time. Um, Like how much time would it literally take to pick up the phone and be like, hi, you know, I've received another offer elsewhere, or I'm sorry, my cat's sick. Like, give me your best excuse on why the mushrooms you had in your refrigerator made you sick. Like I would believe it over just not showing up for an totally. episode for, for an interview. Yep. Um, 
I've had like people come to work and then do drugs in the back and then try and steal what? through someone's purse. Yeah. And we caught it on camera. <laughs> and it was terrible. And then she came to work oh three God. days later in her pajamas, like not realizing what she had done. It was just like, you know, that, that happened. Um, uh, yeah, a lot. <laughs> are you, How are do you, you even, are you familiar with David Harris? David Harris no. of uh, Prosperity Dent. No. Is that the uh, fraudulent guy? Yeah. The, or, yeah. 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 Anti fraudulent guy. So, so he's a friend of mine. And I went to his. So we were just talking about the ODA conference right before we started. I went to, I only went to one talk and it was his talk because it is so interesting. He puts on videos on the screen of them doing like interventions with staff. And it's like, no. they'll do like cutaways and be like, I could tell he's lying because you know, the, the, <laughs> the way like this, like this didn't line up with this. And I'm like, this is the most, it, it's like real life CSI, but like dentistry. It's awesome. Oh my God. If you ever get a chance to go to one of his talks, they are okay. incredible. How does he get away with like it? Food network shows where they like catch the cooks in the kitchen doing bad stuff. And oh man, that's what <laughs> Yeah, it's it's hilarious. But the the story you just mentioned, it's like he has hundreds of those stories. Like I had him on my old podcast and he just told story after story after story. And it was I like feel like an employee would get wind of it and then they'd sue me. Like that's how bad my luck would be. <laughs> is that someone would be like, I know that story. That was me. Yeah. Defamation yeah. of character suit oh, or yeah. something. Yeah. It's Man, brutal, you, gotta, you gotta be so careful with what you say these days because you you never know who's listening and and how you can get in trouble but i feel i don't know man i, I feel even having this podcast I, I feel like we've i've maybe said too much at certain times hey akil <laughs> oh yeah i don't know our cbso yeah. is listening <laughs> with yeah. one ear and i'm in alberta don't listen to me <laughs> yeah well speaking of our cdso if we want to go there you asked me earlier pre-recording and you mentioned it like in passing that like a dentist quote unquote works for me so that's legally not allowed so the rcdso has pretty strict guidelines about partnerships with non-dentists which is like kind of crazy because almost every dso is owned by multiple non-dentists but whatever a podcast topic for another day of how they oil each other grease each other or whatever they're doing in the back end um the agreement between a dental hygienist and a dentist is like a chair rental agreement with a fluctuating management fee and a TMI kind of like taxes, maintenance and insurance sort of thing. Um, so the reality is a dentist can never work for me. Like they can't be my employer employee, uh, or partner business partner in any way. So, um, fun fact, I had a, a quote unquote associate, like what else do you call this person? Like, chair rental human chair rental dentist so it's chair like, rental dentist let's call it chair that. rental dentist like nobody nobody would know what that even means so I, I still say associate because i'm associating myself with this other clinician so my last associate um for the better part of a year told me that he didn't want to open a practice like he he was over the the practice ownership part he owned a dentist he owned a practice in a different country didn't want to deal with it and then a year later apparently i made it look so easy that he left and opened a practice. And now I have another dentist who's with me full time and she's wonderful. But now he's sending me text messages like, man, I should have listened to myself a year ago. Like, why did I do this? Um, it's, it's, it's pretty rough. <laughs> it's a very now, rough uh, situation. Irene, off the tip of my tongue, I'm, yeah. I'm dying to ask you, what is the dynamic? Because the, the traditional relationship is dentist owns practice, hires yeah. hygienist, and now it's flipped. Yes. And I think this is amazing. Like, way to go. You, 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 you. flip you flip the script. And how is the dynamic? So I originally, I've learned a lot over the last three years of um, the type of employer I didn't want to be. So I've worked for some kind of mean girls in the past, you know, locked up in her castle, the corner office, playing solitaire on her computer and like not really interacting with the team. So I was that human when I first opened my practice at this beautiful office. I watched, I would sit there and watch tennis between patients <laughs> and I had my own fancy computer and I did all of my computing and all of my important woman things in there. And then I realized, A, it was an extremely big waste of money because it potentially could have been another operatory that's generating revenue. 
And then also it was secluding me from the team members. I was kind of, you know, in behind the gates where they had to knock and tiptoe on and knock on the door to ask me a question. And, you know, you do the wave in sort of thing. Um, So I realized it was kind of creating this weird vibe um, where even the dentists were doing that. They were like knocking on the glass, um, seeing me on a phone call and like pretending they're kind of like walking by oddly. Um, So I got rid of the office. I got rid of the office. I turned our back kind of storage room area into this like little NASA workstation. We've got like mounted computers and um, like a tabletop bar height um, space where we all use computers and there's no like designated computer for someone. You kind of like, you know, use the station and move around. Um, and I eat lunch in the back with everybody else. Um, I don't have my own space anymore, which is kind of weird, but also kind of cool. And that's changed the way that we communicate with one another a lot more. Um, I don't do any social media when I'm at the office or very little of it. So that's all scheduled on shoot days, social media days. Like I'm not just like pulling out a camera in the middle of a procedure And I have a social media manager and a personal assistant. So like they're handling all my stuff for me while I'm treating patients and I can focus my three days in the operatory and not have to deal with any of the emails and stuff that goes back and forth. Not that I don't love it, but it really takes a lot of your brain power out of that patient that's in the chair. Totally. So that took me a year to figure out. Um, And it was probably one of the best decisions that I made aside from the profitability side of having a third op going, but it was just people don't treat me like the boss. Yeah. They'll follow what I say, but they treat me like an employee. Hmm. Interesting. Interesting. Hey, I got a question. Yeah. Who sure. owns, who owns the files? Like, is it a, a dent? Like uh, mm. I thought that's where the regulation came in is like, who, who owns, owns the, the charts? files? Yes. Or the yes. goodwill of the charts. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, um, yeah, being there, done that because of <laughs> course, when you sell a practice, you want to sell it, not only with its gold, goodwill and assets, you want to keep it together. Yeah. So, um, there's an interesting agreement that a lawyer can draft and I'm happy to share Howard's info with you or Harold, Harold Fetter is my lawyer. Um, it's called it a custodian agreement. So mm. the goodwill of the charts is owned by a corporation and the corporation is headed by a clinician and we are all under the goodwill of the charts by a custodian agreement. And that custodian agreement gets passed down from clinician to clinician or dentist to dentist or dentist to hygienist. Um, so it's kind of an intricate loophole, I'd say. Hmm. Um, I got it. Yeah. So I got a question about leadership and I'm going to be very careful about how I phrase this not <laughs> to get myself in trouble. So like you have, you have kind of two hurdles to get over because you mentioned people aren't taking you seriously. You have the, the hurdle of, you know, dentists might not, you know, being okay with that sort of dynamic. And then the other is, you know, you're a female leader. What, Mm -hmm. what sort of, because there's like, if you look at our classes now, like my class, I'm in third year of, of, of dental school and, you know, our class is pretty much 50, 50, the year behind me is probably 55, 45. But the year behind them, or so the first year dental students are like 60% women. So this is like a big kind of change in, in, in demographic within dentistry. So if you were to speak to, you know, other women um, in positions such as yours, what advice would you give them? I feel like I'm the worst person to give advice to other women because for the better part of my life, I doubted whether I could do this or not. Um, so it makes it easy for me because I don't have children. I don't have any responsibilities aside from my toy poodle, who is basically like my child. Um, and there's <laughs> oh, I no, got, a, I got like, a dog. I know how it is. Yeah, I know how it is. Lou's she's just somehow camouflaged into my couch. Um, <laughs> so I think that makes things a little bit more difficult because being a mother and being a business owner are two full-time jobs and somehow you're trying to fit them into one. So I think if I could give one piece of advice is survey what the next 10 years of your life will look like um, and come up with creative solutions in which you could become an owner, but perhaps have a partner if family life is in your future. If not, then just go for it and jump on in and do the damn thing. If a dental hygienist that is an immigrant who didn't speak English until high school basically could do it, anyone can. Um, 
yeah, I don't know. It's just, everyone's so different. It's hard to, hard to generalize. But just um, what? <laughs> Female, <yeah>. male, <laughs> non-binary, whatever. Just if you want to be a business owner, be a business owner. Someone will give you money. <laughs> what, what made you like take that step? Cause you said you worked in almost every single aspect of dentistry, except practice ownership. And then you jumped right in pre COVID like what what made you like think you can do it because you just said you didn't like you were too nervous but how how did you get the gumption to just do it I never really thought that I could be a great business owner my mother but why not, had, but why not? My, well I, I I looked at my parents right so we are some of all of our experiences totally. and ultimately you're a product of what you were raised in and I was raised in this like super conservative uh eastern European born and raised in a communist country type of type of vibe where you were either a doctor or a lawyer or a failure. So I was none of those three. So I was already a failure. Basically I had nothing to lose in the eyes of my parents. So it's like, let's just try. And I looked at my mom who was a successful business owner as an immigrant. She ran four spas in the city of Toronto and had a really cool business model. She set up these spas in condo buildings. So she worked closely with a company called Tridel and she kind of like copy and pasted DSO spas in condo buildings That's and awesome. I was like my mom still can barely spell like if you were to look at our text message interactions you're like I don't understand what language this is in and if an immigrant is creative and smart enough and sassy and savvy enough to figure it out her offspring must be able to and I was like the teenage daughter that went to her spa and like did the accounting after school like that was me so I had nothing to lose. I was in my 30s. I was disappointed in the practices that I worked in. Um, people talked shit about me. People said I was a difficult employee. My boss used to throw stuff at us. Like I was in like crazy environments. Oh One my of my goodness. bosses like made us take him to a strip club and then stuck us with the bill. Like there was just a lot of stuff what? that happened in 10 years. Yeah. And, and then I was like, I'm done. Like I just can't. I can't do it anymore. And if mom can do it, then I definitely could do it. Um, and then that happened. That all just kind of worked out. You know, I, I learned how to write a business plan. YouTube is amazing. Like YouTube is the best place on earth to learn things really fast. Um, I got a loan from a bank. I learned how to save money, like furiously. I started a startup. I sold scrub caps in order to save money from my personal injection, which had to be like over a hundred grand. So I calculated backwards, like how many scrub caps do I have to sell to learn and to save a hundred thousand dollars? You learn that number really quickly when you have to. So that was just how it all happened. It was the fight and the, I had nothing to lose because I, I was that. at nothing at that point. That's so wicked. Yeah. It's a sweet story. It's a sweet story, but like from a, so like my day job, day job is a dental student. My night job is, you know, I work, I work at Sage. I'm a partner at Sage and we help people buy and sell practices. And one key thing when, you know, you go to buy a practice or start a practice is how do you acquire the financing? You sort of touched on it, but how does it work when it's, you know, a hygienist applying for financing versus yeah. a dentist? Because I can imagine they're two very different it's things. It's difficult. Well, you apply in the same place. So first I started with uh, looking at BDC. I thought BDC perhaps would give me some, some funding, but unfortunately they didn't see my business plan as something that was viable. I went to and their Scotiabank. interest rates are way higher than Yeah, they're the higher, but too. they yeah. say that it's a little bit easier to, to acquire. So first, you know, I, I, I went that route and I was like, I think I could do a little bit better than this. So I went to Scotiabank where my parents had some relationships and, you know, they put you through that same section where chiropractors and physicians and dentists, like the medical health care, whatever group. Um, and you present them with your business plan. They crunch their numbers. They send it to their analyst. Their analyst comes back with some robot voice. It's like, I cannot compute. And, and then they declined me. They're like, unfortunately, you'd have to put in like a significant personal injection for us to even be able to do this for you. Um, so I went to RBC, same thing. I had this like kind of crotchety lady that didn't understand the business model and she and because originally you know I'm, I'm starting with an associate model right away I'm not the main producer I wasn't a restorative hygienist at the time so I wasn't even having like that significantly high billing so she said no and then 
somehow within the next couple of weeks, my case got transferred over to a new person that took over her role. And he Googled me. Like he just typed my name into a Google search and realized that I was doing more with dental hygiene. I was speaking and traveling and podcasting and social media and all this stuff. And uh, he then presented it to his analysts in kind of a different way. My space is also rented out for a CE. I run my social media company through it. So the space is rented out by Tooth Life Media. You know, there's a lot of moving parts um, on the on the corporation side. And he secured me a loan, but still made me put in a significant personal injection of almost 15%, um, which is crazy. Cause like you literally could come out of down school tomorrow and yeah. be like, Hey bank, can 100%. I receive a million dollars? Like I also have half a million dollars of debt, With debt. but like, yeah. can I have a yeah. million dollars please? Cause I'd like to open my own startup and like, I don't know a 14 a from a 12 B like that 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 could happen but for me with someone with significant experience they were they they were very eager to say no so it just took that one person to convince and multiple revisions to the to the business model originally i wanted it to be a one-op shop like just me myself and irene in my little space doing my thing and then i wanted that been the, like the best name too me i was just gonna <laughs> say that would, that would so be catchy. wicked <laughs> yeah and then and then that turned into like well you know i want intego chairs and i want uh, Surak and I want a mill and a print and all these things. And, you know, it's like cha-ching, cha-ching, cha-ching. So that yeah. goes from one op to four ops very quickly. Do you, do you feel like the blessing behind all this was it was pre COVID because if you went back and asked for that loan, now interest rates are even higher. The amount of money it would take to open up that practice with construction and, and equipment costs is up at least 25%. Like, would you do the same thing today? Uh, yeah, I think it was kind of a blessing in, 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 in retrospect, not only that for that, but also for new patients. So we average without marketing, like 60 to 70 new patients a month easily Wow. because of our, yeah, it is. Yeah. It's crazy amount. And okay. I'll tribute some of it to social media. Like people follow me on Instagram, but most of the people that follow me on social media are dental people, which I have many patients that are dental patients, but the ones that I'm seeing are neighborhood people. I mean, my office is in the North beaches. So it's a super small kind of tight knit community, really young professionals with lots of kids. Um, and they want to stick close to home. Like if I look at my medical history forms, I use Yappy, which is like a, a digital system. If I look at the reason why people are coming to the practice, one of them is live close by or have moved into the area or now working from home. So they want to walk to the dentist on their lunch break and then, and then not go downtown where in the path. And I feel really sorry for the dental offices that are in the core. Um, they just want to stick close to home. And if you are, you make them happy, they refer. And honestly, the Facebook groups, like the mom Facebook groups and the local community Facebook groups have been amazing. I'm not even part of them because I'm afraid that <laughs> as soon as one person says I brought my nine month old to tooth life studio, like all of, like two weeks later, I'm just like covered with nine to 12 month old kids. I don't know what to do with them all. Huh. Wow. That, that's awesome. Do yeah. you have, do you have someone to help you with running the office? Like, do you have an office manager? Do you have, I do. Do you have people to yeah, help yeah. run the show? Yeah. Office manager, treatment coordinator, uh, full-time receptionists, full-time doc, two hygiene, uh, two assistants, one floater. Um, so yeah, we run, a pretty tight ship where I would consider us to be a relatively small team, but, uh, yeah, everyone's been really great. And we're finally oh. down to an all female crew. Ooh. There you go. There, there you have it. How common is this? Like, I've never heard of this concept before. It's not, not super common, but not extremely uncommon. I think I'm just kind of the most public one or the loudest one about it. Um, there are a few other dental hygienists that own practices. A friend of mine is a, is a part owner in like multiple practices as a hygienist. Um, yeah, I think we, we kind of have like each have our own little pocket. Um, many practice independently without a dentist or have like a really strong referral, local referral. Uh, many practice in um, assisted living facilities or do remote or teledentistry. Um, or, you know, they, they have mobile units that they go to people's homes or facilities, 
but I think it's really expensive to have a brick and mortar dental space or dental practice. And the ones that I do know of, like either someone's family owns a building or they have a building that they're renting out to other disciplines. So they're able to subsidize their rent. You know, you got to get creative if this is what you want to do. Um, I got really lucky with my space because it was completely concrete and there was nothing in it. So when I was using my real estate agent, I used a commercial real estate agent to find my space. There was a couple of places I was looking for uh, or looking at, and this one was just a concrete shell. It required a significant amount of pre-reno or lease leasehold improvements. It cost two hundred thousand dollars to do core drilling in the concrete. Oh God! Yeah, luckily really? I negotiated that really well with the landlord uh, because it's on the main floor of a condo building, so it's like. Yeah street front and there's like an 11 story condo building above me um but it's the structural floor and yeah it was 200k we had to like have like fancy floor x-rays to figure out where the rebar was we had to redesign yeah. the space multiple times because i couldn't core drill to get my pipes and vac and stuff into the basement we had to like there was a small grade because i'm in the be beaches so we had to put in a reverse pump to pump back up to the highest point oh of the office yeah. so like there was a lot of things that uncovered after we started construction which was another reason why we were so delayed um so yeah the landlord covered like probably two to three hundred k of the total almost seven um and I was, I was lucky that that happened, but yeah, I, if I could do it all over again, I don't know if I would do it differently. Holy cow. We've, we've been profitable K. basically since day one, which is kind of crazy. Knock on wood. I mean, like wood, maybe. you're such a good, ah. like you, you strike me as such a good and true entrepreneur, which is, you know, I kind of, I see it in two ways. Like, Oh, there's the dog. <laughs> I see it in I'll two ways. It right? It's like, it's if you look at dentistry and dentists, like they're almost on the track to very easily become an entrepreneur, but it's very difficult for hygienists to become entrepreneurs and you don't see them, you know, nearly as often. Are you doing something in, in, in the way of, you know, advocating for entrepreneurship, like at large for hygienists? Cause there's a lot of great businesses that can exist within hygiene. Sure. I mean, advocacy in general on social media has been helpful, but I, I consult so that I did do a lot of stuff for free at the beginning where I would say, sure, like, let me share with you all of my spreadsheets and my business plan and the way that I did all these things. And then I realized, A, I spent a lot of money to do that, but money is also time. So now I kind of have a flat fee. I'm like, I'll help you build a business. And I've done that for a few hygienists. Like, this is the cost. This is how long it's going to be um, before you can open your doors if you stick with me. Um, and I share, you know, my contractors and my lawyers and the plumbers and the cabinet makers and the companies where I ordered my flooring from like every little bit in piece, but it still comes down to money. Like the reality is a dental hygienist is still going to need to have a pocket full of cash before they could go to any bank and say, I want a cookie cutter Irene's business plan because not everyone is going to be me. So how hard can I really advocate if maybe as a profession, not everyone is there yet. And Irene, mm -hmm. what about like, do people really want to own a practice? Because you know, my next question for you is going to be practice owner to practice yeah. owner. When I first started my practice, when I bought my practice back in 2010, January 4th, 2010, I opened the door, massive flood. Worst day of my life. <laughs> still crying about it. I can still see the tears on. I can feel no, the tears no. running down my face as my multi-million dollar investment is underwater. And it was underwater again last month because we had a big, you know, it got warm out, all the water. Shit happens as a practice owner. Yep. Have you have you felt any of this? Like have you had like the the disaster, the yeah. you know, your the my shit HVAC falls has been down for the last three weeks. Literally, I had a fire in my office last week because a oh space God. heater caught on fire. Really? Yes. Oh. Yes. And I and I was with a patient and I was doing like this icon procedure, this resin infiltration yeah. procedure. And I went in and and I did like a full arch. So it, it was it was in, intense. It was like a two hour procedure. And I came out of my office and I was like, I smell burning plastic. And like someone tried to convince me that it was like the space heaters are new. So they give off this smell. And I was like, okay, whatever. So I went back into the operatory, I came out and it was like significant. So I started like sniffing around 
And it was the space here had melted the plug into the wall. And I'm like, this is how fires start. Yeah. Yeah. And I've had multiple um, floods too. We have a recessed eyewash station because I hated the look of like a regular eyewash station. So I wanted the one that kind of folds down like a table. Yeah. So that pipe burst in the wall. And I came into work one day and it was all just like water everywhere. My x-ray sensor broke last week. Like one of the screws snaps, like $13,000 yeah, later. No big deal, right? No NBD. <laughs> yeah. Everyone like carries those things around. Like they're wrapping spaghetti around their wrist. And I'm like, there is a glass fiber optic inside yeah. of this thing. But they're I not see, paying for it. So they don't no, see that, I right? see like my laser. I have like a Suro blue laser, $20,000 diode laser with the cords just like wrapped around it like we're tying tying red bows on christmas presents um so we had a team meeting yesterday and i was like okay we need to like we need to take a beat and we need to like look at these things i'm like this camera that we have we have like a three thousand dollar um shofu i special three dental digital camera because nobody wanted to use a dslr so i was like fine i'll come up with a solution where you point and shoot and you get a good photo this thing fell on the floor in front of me. Like she was wiping something down and she just like smashed it. And she was just like, Oh, (laughs) she like blew it (laughs) off. Like it was like dust. And she's like, I'm so sorry. I'm like, no, like we need to have a team meeting. So we assembled the troops and I was like, all I see is dollar signs and small problems become big problems really fast. If you don't say something. So yeah, disasters happen every day. I trans was down a couple of days ago. I don't know if you knew it was down, but it was down. We couldn't send any claims through. Our internet was down. I think that's the worst when the internet goes down because the there's nothing that down. can be done. Yeah, because everything no. goes through the internet, right? Right. Oh, man. I, I totally hear yeah. you. I, I had uh, an assistant drop the iTero scanner and you're like, boom, 13K. there goes 30K. Yeah, 30. minimum. 30, man. Whoa. 13K. What what version of <laughs> iTero are you running? Yeah, <laughs> mine was like 60. Which one do you have? Mine's like the new I guess Neary. Mine's old. Okay. We just I don't have one. an iTero. So we so. have a we have a step in our office. So op three is up this one step. Oh my and god! Then, so things so every down. time we oh go up, goodness. two yeah. people have to lift it to go up this one step. It's just like a regular one step concrete step. But every time I see this iTero go up, it like my heart drops. I'm like, some we need like a little seat belt for the. the <laughs> The device, like, can we just put a little like Velcro around it or something? Yeah. And oh, we recently man. bought a um, airflow, like an airflow yep. prophylaxis master for GBT. That thing's broken twice. Like they're really? and we only had it for six months. Yeah. It's super finicky. Is that um, worth the investment? Yes and no. It is a lot of headache, um, but we have gotten a lot of new patients from it. People like cool things right and i can say like i'm one of five offices in the city that has it so yeah it is worth it but the problem is if you have multiple hygienists they all want one oh i know that's why i don't want to get one i have 10 hygienists and i just man i feel like i monopolize it when i'm in yeah it's it's like but it is a really good feature for practice yeah if that's the vibe that you have i think like on on this on this train are you familiar with like that TikTok trend, like X? It's like usually couples oh, that yeah. do it. Yeah. <laughs> okay. What are your X with like, I, whether it's people that work with you, people that work for you, because, you know, you have a really oh. interesting perspective because you were in the position that you now hire for. So it's right. like, you know, what you would have seen as an ick back then might not yeah. be an ick now. So like, what are the true X? <laughs> Okay, well, so there's some of them are super specific. So one of my biggest icks with clinical charting is when people use weird abbreviations, like just spell out the whole word. <laughs> like examples instead of the word with, they'll just put a W. It's like just write oh, with. Okay. It's three well, letters. I do, <laughs> I do W. Right, like W. Um, <laughs> so that irritates me. Um, when we do our perio charting, you do your like you know your probing and then your recession. It bugs me when people don't actually put the zero, like zero, one, zero, zero, one, zero. They're just like blank, blank one. And then to me, it's like, did they miss those numbers or was that intentional? (laughs) So that irritates me. Um, Not having a system or a sequence. So I do everything exactly the same way. Every patient hygiene visit looks the same. 
I start on the upper right, I go to the left, I come back on the lingual. I do the same on the lower right, I go to the left, I come back on the lingual. I don't like bop around when I'm scaling. Um, so it bugs me when people like start on the left side, then they go to the lower and then they're like, there's no order. Maybe that's OCD. I don't know. <laughs> I think we all do that though. Like I take out teeth in an order, like when I do wisdom teeth all day, it's, Maybe. I start on lower left and and you work your way around the clock, right? Like it's, but nobody, not everyone does that. I don't know why though. Cause it makes you feel comfortable. I, I right. find that routine makes you feel like you're at home and it yeah. keeps you confident with every case. And right. uh, that lack of, or that surprise throws you off your game. So yeah. Um, hmm. Squeezing patients in is a really big irritant for me. Um, Why is that? Because I don't feel I can do my whole sequence and then mm. I omit something and it kind of irritates me. So it's like, well, what of these things do I put off until next time? Is it the recall or is it the x-rays or is it the probing? Cause each one of those things are really important. And I feel like they should all be done at the same time together for the most comprehensive exam. So when someone like shows up 10 minutes late and their appointment is already 10 minutes shorter than it should be, I'm like, whoa, 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 comprehensive care. So that kind of bugs me. Um, luckily I know the boss and she doesn't care if I like bring the patient <laughs> back. Um, uh, yeah, just disorder. People that don't wear scrub caps. I don't know why now that really, me. why is that? Why is that? How are you going to fit know this hair in a scrub cap? I'll are you send kidding you one. <laughs> Jason okay. wears my scrub caps. You've seen him he wear has my some, scrub like, caps. some like nice slick back hair. It fits in. You know, he I has have to a wear really one big head. Ones. You should That's tell true. him that I said <laughs> that. Um, he's, <laughs> that he's a very big guy. He's got big features. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Jason, if you're listening, we're sorry. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> we're sorry, man. <laughs> we love you. Oh, no. Yeah. Um, I don't know. I think everyone's got their own stuff. Disorder is a big irritant for me or like an un, unorganized operatory. It's just like shit all over the place. I can't handle it. Like, I also don't like cords. So my operatories don't have any cords that touch the ground. Oh. So everything is like the continental system where you kind of pull the little lever yeah. down. And then all of our suction lines are like two inches off the ground. So like nothing is touching the floor i chipped my front tooth on on getting my foot caught in one of the like really? piece cords and i face first into the ground so i chip i literally chipped my front tooth and i was like this is it when i opened my own practice nothing's touching the floor that's like my ultimate worst nightmare like that's like i wake up in the more in the morning and i'm like checking my teeth that i chip my teeth i couldn't even imagine i would lose my mind if i chipped yeah. my front tooth as a you know it was a, a small chip but dental. nonetheless very present chips a chip man yeah. hey uh irene i got a question for you you know sure. there's a lot of dentists that are listening a lot of newer dentists listen to this and um being a, a practice owner like i said i work with hygienists all day i feel like most of them hate me even though i, I love them so much and i try to be so pleasant and happy but how can dentists effectively communicate with their hygienists to create strong teams? Like mm -hmm. what, what is it that, that we need to do to create this unifying dental badassery? I think it's education. So okay. Irene 1.0 didn't know much about restorative. So I practiced most of my life. And I think back to those conversations that I had with my old bosses where perhaps I would miss something. It was a big filling and, sh you know, they'd come in for the recall and did you see anything? And I would be like, no, I, I don't think I saw anything. And she's like, well, this is a huge filling. It's falling apart. It needs a crown. And I'm like, I don't know. I don't, I didn't see it. I didn't know what that was. Um, so now when I think back to it as a restorative clinician, I can see these things really early. Mm -hmm. um, and I, sometimes I'm the one that brings it up because I use disclosing agent on every patient. So I do Optrigate disclosing agent, rinse it all off, intraoral camera of every restoration that's in the mouth. Start on the upper right, go all the way around. Anything that's dark purple, or if there's a little gap, then I know it's either a deficient margin, something's breaking, micro leakage, I can see a cavo surface. Like these are words we're not taught in dental hygiene school. And these are words I didn't know until May of last year when I graduated restorative dental hygiene. So it's this lack of communication because we just don't know the same words and we're not present in those procedures. And I'd be surprised if there are many dental hygienists that weren't assistants before that have actually witnessed the beginning to end 
of a filling to mm, understand that's a good point. Why would you prep with a rubber dam versus why wouldn't you prep with a rubber dam? And um, what's the difference between the white wedge and the orange wedge and the yellow wedge? When do you use a wedge versus when do you not use a wedge? What's a matrix? Like all of these words are just words that you would never know until you actually sit down to do this entire procedure. And then you realize, oh, okay, so there's a deficient margin here because it was actually a pretty deep sub restoration. And then when I cured it, my wedge moved and now I have a void, like all of these little things that we just don't know. So um, I, I figured out something in the last little while. We do this thing at my office called the Tooth Life Study Club. So once a month, I have the Spear online education app. I don't know if you've used that app before. Um, and there are modules and there's pathways. So pathways are really cool. It's like a series of videos that are all aligned under a specific topic. And um, each team member has their own login. And we assign these videos and they have to watch these videos and they have one month to do it. The expectation is that you're watching in the first two weeks and then you're implementing it in the last two weeks. Mm. And then when we have our study club, you talk about what you've learned you tell me how you've applied it into your practice and perhaps you mention a case where you noticed this on. So it's interesting now our receptionist understand uh, there's a prosto perio series where they talk about referrals for, for recession. Like how early would you refer a patient out for a graft versus when would you do a class five restoration? And like, what's the difference between doing class five that's sub versus using like the three millimeter rule. So my, assistant and my receptionist are now chatting about patients that they witnessed us doing this stuff on. And it's kind of cool because they would have not known that before. So the biggest gap in communication is knowledge. And we're all, we're all smart people, but we don't want to admit that we don't know stuff. Oh, ego, ego. <laughs> I don't even consider it killer. ego. I just feel like, you know, I don't want to admit that I don't know something that my boss knows, like, I want to impress my employer, sure. but I'm only going to impress my employer with the skills that I know. And then we're butting heads, but it also goes the other way around. Like, no offense. Do you know how many dentists don't know how we probe or they pick up a probe and they're just like, Every single one. It, like <laughs> bobbing yeah. it in there. Like it's Halloween and we're looking for apples. Like <laughs> the, I feel like whenever I probe, everyone jumps. So I just, um, <laughs> I give Too you guys much pressure. All the you're breaking that like attachment. All of That's a sudden there's fault, a nine millimeter pocket. And you're like, did you not notice this pocket? I'm like what pocket? That's why you so, freeze them first, Irene. Yeah. So <laughs> we use this phrase where we ask a question and then immediately we say it's okay to say no. So for example, um, I did, I do, like I mentioned earlier, I do resin infiltration. And sometimes if it's like an E1 lesion or even a D1 lesion, depending on the tooth, instead of prepping, we'll, we'll use resin and it'll still look like a cavity. Like it'll still look like caries on the radiograph. It'll perpetually look like caries. So when we pull up the x-rays, you know, the assistant's eyes go big. Cause they're like, you did something on this tooth, but it still looks the same. And I'm like, do you know what resin infiltration looks like on an x-ray after it's been done? And then you pause and then you say, it's okay to say no. And then immediately like, oh no, I have no idea. It's like, okay, well, it will look exactly the same. So like, don't give the eyes, but that phrase is kind of helpful. Like for example, if you were coming in to do a checkup and you notice this huge restoration and perhaps it's a craze line. And I don't know if you chase cracks or not. Um, and you're like, yeah, I should take this out. Cause it looks like it could potentially be a cuspal fracture. So I'm probably going to prep it for a crown if you say to the hygienist, Hey, did you notice this crack here? And do you know what might happen and pause and then say, it's okay to say no hundred percent of the time that clinician yeah, will say, say no. no. And then they won't feel like you're finding their fault versus like that. teaching That's them a, good a skill. Tip. I killed all, as a dental best. student. Oh, no, I was just going to, I, I did not want to take it there. <laughs> I did. Start Violence asking questions. <laughs> yeah. No, Did you understand you're... anything I said? It's okay to say no. no. <laughs> <laughs> I've been zoned out this whole podcast, really. But no, it's 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 just when you thought you were in, you were going to interview the the Instagrammer, it turned out to be clinical. Damn. Yeah, exactly. I want to take it there because I would be very upset with myself if I didn't ask you about your your Instagram following because obviously 
you know, you're, you're big on Instagram, you have like 28,000 followers. And, you know, I, I had a bit of a business idea that I wanted to, I wanted to sort of, you know, propose to, you know, some dentists and say, you know, it's every dentist now is on Instagram and every single one is trying to self-manage. And it's hilarious because, you know, the catch line was, are you done dancing for patients? Right. Cause mm-hmm. like all of them are on TikTok, all of them are dancing. I don't all dance. Are... I don't know if you've noticed, but I don't dance. No, you don't, you don't dance. But no. what, what's interesting though, is a lot of people that I know that are actually big on Instagram, you know, whether it's tattoo artists, dentists, um, lawyers, whoever, they say it doesn't really result in more patients, more clients, more um, revenue coming through the door. So what is your experience with that? And what is the right way to use these social media platforms as a practice owner? Right. So I don't post very much on my office Instagram because our guidelines are actually pretty strict here in Ontario with who and how you can solicit. So let's say I do paid partnerships on Instagram for a specific company. Those paid partnerships have to be directly to dental professionals. I can't be like, Hey, patients with gingivitis. Now you need to use XYZ toothpaste. Like that goes against our marketing guidelines. So, and even on social media with saying you're an expert or you do, you know, you proficient in something that goes against guidelines too. So my direct to consumer on my office is non-existent. Um, I'm kind of banking on patients that are coming to me are going to be either by referral because I do restorative, I do ortho, I do myofunctional therapy on kids. We do tongue ties and phrenectomies and tongue training and whatever, thumb suck breaking, all of that stuff. I'm hoping that I'm getting patients by referral from other clinicians, even for perio. Like I get referrals from other hygienists that send me their patients because their office doesn't have the capabilities to do like biofilm testing or DNA testing. Um, You're right. Like I don't get a lot of public patients because I don't cater to that on Instagram. So they probably don't see my stuff, Um, but it does help you with SEO. So, you know, if your name pops up a lot, people are mentioning you and you're getting mentioned on their stuff, the likelihood of someone saying, dental hygiene treatment or cleanings in Toronto or cleanings in the beaches, that is probably going to pop up my tooth life studio far greater than if I did none of it. So there is this like behind the scenes SEO kind of amplification that happens. Um, So like, for example, I used to work for a holistic dentist before I left that practice to open mine. If you type in holistic dental hygiene, my name still pops up because I wrote like 10 blogs for her on her personal office website. Uh, And for some reason, those are searched a lot. So now that is connected to my practice because I'm no longer on her website, but the internet is still like, where's this holistic dental hygienist that people were searching for so many times and now they find my office. So there is a value if you are consistent. What do you find is the best way to market towards patients? Like in your experience, is it just writing blog posts or how do you, how do you get any? I haven't done any paid ads, so I don't know. I see them pop up all the time. It's like $500 off your Invisalign cases or uh, free white. There's, so there's a dental office that opened up across the street from me, like six months after I opened, they took over this like teeny tiny coffee shop that had rodents and they turned it into some dental office that had like the generic old guy with the dentures holding the apple ads like film on the windows um just like a bunch of different yeah ick ick, exactly big (laughs) ick and i sat there in tears i was like this is the worst thing that's ever going to happen to me like they're going to take all of my new patients um and then like within a couple of months the light bulbs out of their sign started to dim and it didn't say dental office it said null office and they never fixed it it was like you know you could tell that it was that office and if anything they did me a favor because they took the 99 dollar cleaning patients like they posted yeah. in their windows that they do free whitening and a 99 dollar cleaning i do not know what a 99 dollar cleaning is nor would i ever like to know what a 99 dollar cleaning looks like but it um, takes those patients out of your practice and that's awesome. They're gone. Yeah. And now I get the patients that are like, charge me what you'll charge me. You, yeah. If you're above fee guide, cool. That, that's great. Um, 
I thought that was the worst thing that could happen and it wasn't. So I don't know. I don't do any paid ads. I'm sure you can find some offices that do. Um, but for me, word of mouth. I mean, treat the people yeah. that are in your chair the best and they will send other people just like them to you. Nice people usually send nice people. I so found true. good karma. Least. Good karma. Yeah. What was that point you were saying that you're not actually allowed to market to patients? I didn't quite get that. So dental hygiene guidelines state that we're not allowed to promote a specific product or procedure to um, a non-dental professional. So I can't go out there and put together a YouTube video on the best whitening. Zoom whitening is the best whitening. This is the only whitening that you should ever use, dear patient, because um, that shows favoritism to a specific product, uh, perhaps that I have an alliance with, and then that goes against marketing guidelines. So you can't actually do that. A lot of people do, and then they get in trouble for it. Um, so yeah, there's some pretty interesting guidelines if you look through the actual marketing guidelines they're called as part of the cdho and the rcdso has one too so like for example the rcdso has a bunch of stuff about naming you can't name your practice yeah brightest whitest smile dental or um call yourself the most affordable dentist in the city or specialist in removing nose hairs. Like you can't, you can't say <laughs> any of those things. You can't show that you are more superior than the person down the street that has the same DMD or DDS. I immediately put same. my head down when you said the nose hair thing. <laughs> like, yeah, uh -huh. we were all like, Irene, what, what are you saying? <laughs> yeah. I look right in the mirror after. Good lord. <laughs> oh, it's so awesome. interesting though, because like you know the the mecca the like the golden goose of marketing when it comes to dentistry is bringing patients to the door right? right like yes there's like the search engine optimization there's the you know goodwill there's you know networking within your community of practitioners but mm -hmm. you know at the end of the day dentists really care I, I would i would argue that nine out of ten dentists who start a instagram page are doing it to bring in patients Right. So it's interesting. There's that nuance there where you can't actually market to patients. I, I don't know. I don't, Neki, do you, like, what, what do you think? I've yet to market to a patient and I 100% agree with Irene. I'm not the least expensive dentist in my town. That's for sure. Um, I'm completely non-assignment. I 100% agree with Irene that if, if you treat patients with respect and you do what's best for them, you treat them as if you know, you're treating your father or I'm treating you a kill. I, I treat everyone the same way. Um, and word of mouth has built my entire practice from, from the beginning 15 years ago. So I'm very lucky. And I, I a hundred percent resonate. Like I hear what you're saying, Irene, and you're totally right. Um, I think we share a similar philosophy for sure. It's like the, you don't see commercials about Bentleys yeah. or Ferraris or Lamborghinis, you might see like a an E-class Mercedes ad during <clears throat> like a golf tournament or the Wimbledon, but you don't you don't you don't see their high high level vehicles being advertised on like CP24 kind of thing. Yeah. So and and that's okay for you to be that office and it's also okay for you to be the $99 office if that's what you want. I mean, it's all about setting expectations and standards for yourself. Of course, the goal is that we're all meeting those high level of standards across the board. Um, but not everyone is going to be you. Um, I had a patient walk out on me last week because she didn't want me to take her blood pressure. We take blood pressure on every patient. Mm -hmm. um, we it was her first time in the office. Uh, she was a new patient and, um, you know, comprehensive visit. The first thing we do is review medical history and take blood pressure. So she reviewed and she said, I've never had my blood pressure taken in a practice before, in an office before. I've been seeing the same dentist for 25 years. Why are you taking my blood pressure now? And she was very upset with me. And I tried to explain it to her. I have a little laminated sheet. I pull it out. I say, you know, our guidelines state this. Um, it's really important. And she's taking a slew of medications. So she said, I'm not staying here. I'm sorry. I'm going to go back to my other practice, probably for the best Yeah, peace because out. I'm not going to be able to meet your needs 
or your expectations of the type of dentistry that you're looking for. And on her like intake forms, the concern was that teeth were breaking. So that just tells me that perhaps the practice that she was in was kind of carpentry, you know, just slapping a little bit of plaster in to keep things in place, not really looking at things kind of comprehensively and over the big picture. And there was a really great uh, video we watched on Spear where um, Dr. Frank Spear will print off an occlusal photo of the patient at their new patient exam. So they take a series of photos and then he takes one of those clicky pens with the red, the green, and the blue, and the black, and he'll physically circle the restorations on there in different colors based on when they'll need to be replaced in that patient's lifetime. So you might have an old crown that's, you know, there's some recession around it. You see that little black margin, but the but it, it fits fine and it looks fine and the contacts are good. You know, that might get a number two around it, meaning that in your lifetime, at some point that'll get need to get placed. There's a lot of red, those are gonna have to be replaced first. And that we've adopted in our practice so that when patients come in, they know that the dentistry in your mouth isn't just gonna live there forever. There will be a time where it needs to be replaced and we're gonna do them in the right way so that we wanna fix things the day before they break. This lady didn't have that luxury. Everything was breaking for her all the time. There was constantly a fire that was being put out. And her perception of dentistry is that we're here to fix broken. But our level of dentistry is we fix before things break. Um, and she's just not the right human for us. And maybe one day she will be. Maybe she'll come back. Um, like the patient I had a couple of weeks ago, they went to a different practice because she moved and then showed back up and said, I'm really sorry, I left, but now I'm yeah, back. I see that a lot too, yeah. Mm -hmm. So yeah. I went to this office in Scarborough and it wasn't what I expected and I'm back. I had a cleaning there, but I don't know how good it was. They were really fast. Um, will you take me back? And I'm like, open arms, baby girl. Like, now she's here for life. <laughs> Standing your ground, I love it. Well, Irene, I don't know where the past hour went, it has been, been great to, yeah, it's been an hour. It's, check my uh, invisible watch. it's been, <laughs> yeah, exactly. It just looks sophisticated. Uh, it's been great getting to know you and and hearing your story. And, and, and I'm glad we got to, you know, know Irene's ex. That was, uh, <laughs> I think that was the first of the pod. Um, but where can people get in touch with you? Instagram or better yet, just go to Google and search my name. And then click all of the links that pop up. <laughs> Help me with my <laughs> SEO. Uh, Tooth Life Irene, SEO. Tooth Life Irene on Instagram is perfect. Awesome, awesome. You, you heard it here first, so uh, so so go reach out, go uh, go show her new practice some love. If there's any weird patients that are listening to a dental podcast, <laughs> I don't know why that would be the case, but uh, but but yeah, it was such a such a pleasure having you on. Thank, Thank you, Irene. You. Thanks for having me. I need to have you guys on my podcast now. We need to do a two for one. <laughs> oh, for sure. Good. We'll do a swap. What's, what's, what's the name of your podcast? You might as well tell the world you're here. Oh, Tooth or Dare podcast. Ooh, tooth or yeah. Dare. That's great. You're good with the name tooth plays, dare. eh? I mean, hey, you do what you got to do. Tooth or Dare. <laughs> Me and mm. myself and Irene. That should have been it. <laughs> <laughs> I say you do a rebrand. I like that. Mm, yeah. <laughs> exactly. Thank you. All right, All right, everyone. Peace out, peeps. Thank you, Irene.